Hi, in this tutorial we will study some notes that uh, present some examples about dependency preserving the compositions and uh, some information about how do we identify the current normal form of a table. In this chapter, again, the main idea is to normalize tables. So far we haven't normalized any tables. To do that, first we need to inspect the current state of the table because the table is probably already a good table. For that we want to assign normal forms. The best normal form is the one that we're going to call BCNF. If BCNF doesn't work because it's not dependency preserving, then we're going to settle or we're going to be happy with a 3NF normal form. However, we don't want our tables to be 2NF or 1NF. So the, the bad designs of tables will be 2NF and 1NF. 3NF, we will be okay with that if we cannot find a decomposition that is BCNF and dependency preserving. Now the composition, remember, we split in the table. When we split the table, we want two things. We want the, the, the composition to be lossless joint, that's something that we discussed in the previous tutorial. And we also want that dependency preserving. What it means is that once we divide that, all the dependencies can still be enforced. Look at the following example. This is table R with attributes A, B, C, and D. And this is a zero function on dependencies. Now, for some reason, maybe we think that this is not a good design. And then we divide in R into four tables, which is Q, Q is the decomposition. So it's R1, R2, and R3. Now, maybe this is a better design. We don't know that yet. But what we want is that this, uh, when we do the join with R1 and R2 and R3, we should get back the information about R. That's what we call lossless join. If we just get exactly what we got, nothing else, no, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Now, something else that we want is each table has a set of associated functional dependencies. Then what we usually do is, okay, some of the dependencies, for example, A, the uh, uh, functional determines B or A derives B, can be enforced on R, R1. So we can put that there. B determines C can be implied in, in, in R2, and C derives D can be enforced in R3. But what about the last functional dependency, D implies A? So initially we say no, where we were losing that dependency. If we are, then we say this decomposition is not dependency preserving. That's what it means. However, we don't make we don't decide that yet until we follow the algorithm that is described in the PowerPoint for this class. So here the question is: is Q dependency preserving? So the algorithm that is described there indicates that uh, um, and, and then there's something else that we can see with the, 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 if we go with the dependency graph just to get more information, A determines B, B determines C, C determines D, which means they are all, in this case, they are all candidate keys. You see A determines everything, I mean, the other attributes the same the we C, and D. So now the first three dependencies, like the one that I say A derives B, B, C, and C, D, we can see directly from the setup that they are preserved. Preserved means they still can be uh, used by one of the tables. So why? Because A, B is a subset of R1. R1 has an A and B, then R1 and B is preserved, and the same for B, C, and C, D. However, the D, A, we don't know yet. And then in the PowerPoint, there is an algorithm that says, well, if that's the case, then compute a W, and uh, in, in in that W, what we do is uh, um, that we check if the attribute in the right hand side of the dependency that looks that is not being preserved in this case A is a subset of that W. If it is, that means it is preserved, so we didn't really need that dependency because it can be preserved. So that we do is we initialize, like it says in the algorithm, and then it says, okay, that W, the initial value is D, which is the 
the left hand side of the dependency that is now being that looks like it's not being preserved, the one that we're questioning, the D implies A. So initial value for that W is D. And again, the right hand side A, so A should be a subset of that W. So this is the initial value. And then this is the formula that will apply. We iterate over each one of the tables. So this is what the W says, W union, W intersection with R1. And then this is plus, means the closure intersection with Ri. So this is what I have here. So this is my first iteration. AB is my first table. BC is my second table. And CD is my second table. Then I compute the formula, and then I get in the values of W. Look at the Ws, D, D, and then I get this CD. The algorithm says that we stop if the W that didn't change. Initial value W is D, and then it changed to CD. Then we iterate again with the new value of W using the formula. Then we get this. Now, W change again because the initial value for this iteration was CD and then of the iteration I got BC. Then I do it again. And then on the next iteration, I notice that I'm adding the A. And A is the attribute that, we, that is in the right hand side of the D implies A. Then we stop there. We don't need to continue because then A is a subset of W. Then we say that D is also preserved. Now, we didn't get A, and let's suppose that this is BC, and then I finish with this iteration as a steam PC, and then it didn't change, then I don't do any more iterations, and then A is not a subset of W, then D implies A is not preserved. Any one of the dependencies is not preserved, then the decomposition is not dependency preserving. But it's not the case here, because A was a subset of W. Therefore, D is also preserved, and the final conclusion, Q is a dependency preserving the composition. So that's what we do. Again, to summarize is we check. You see the little check that I have there, A plus B. Check that is preserved. It is preserved. It is preserved. Here I didn't know initially by inspecting. Why? Because DA is not an element of any of the three proposed tables that are there. Right? That's what we do, these doublings. Okay. Now, let's look at the following example. This is another example. So here is the table bank loans, which I'm going to call R. And then there is bank debt that I'm going to call B. And uh, this is uh, uh, A and H. And then the second table is L, which is going to have the C. So here should be a parenthesis. So, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is, this is just one table. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is B, A, H. B A H L C A T, which is my last part. So A T is the amount, C is the customer name, L is the loan number, H is the headquarters, and so on. B is the bank name, and R is the bank loans. This is the table F that has two dependencies. And now what we want to check is uh, the normal form. So this is this is what we do. We get the candidate keys first. So from this is the table. We got a set of functional dependencies. So normalization is based on functional dependencies. With, with the functional dependencies, we can inspect the current normal form of a table. For that, we need to find the candidate keys. We already explained this in a previous tutorial. So here is a, a dependency graph with these two functional dependencies, the only incoming and the no incoming. Remember, the only incoming means this has to be part of the candidate key. If this is a candidate key, that will be the only candidate key. Now we notice that A by itself doesn't derive anything. But uh, uh, I'm sorry, the only uh, incoming means this cannot be part of the candidate key. I'm sorry, put it that part was the no incoming other one that are very important, which in this case is the H, the AT, and the C. That means nothing derives there. Them. And then uh, the other one says B and L. And then remember, it is together, these one, two, three, four, five elements uh, become the, they are candidate key. Then this is the only candidate key, which is the case for this example. Now, in the PowerPoint, there is also a concept about prime attributes and non-prime attributes. Once we identify all candidate keys, the prime attributes are the ones that are elements from every candidate key. So B by itself is a prime attribute. Don't confuse that with a candidate key, which means is B is the element of a candidate key, L, H, C, A, T. The ones that are not 
part of a candidate here, the one that we call non prime. So we identify this. So again, the first step to find the current normal form is we need the candidate keys, prime and non prime, and then we check the following. The for each functional dependencies, we check the left hand side and right hand side. So the left hand side of the first dependency BL should be a super key. It is if this is a super key, and then B is also a super key, then the table is BCNF. Is BL um, a super key? No, because the candidate key is BLHTTA. So no. So for that reason, R is not in BCNF. Then we check is this, and then we need to do that for every functional dependency. B is the case, I mean not, but I mean as soon as one of them is not uh, is not okay with this side being the, the super key, then it's not BCNF. Then we check the right hand side which is in this case A, and A should be prime, and A is not prime, then this disqualify the table to be 3NF. So this table is not BCNF, it's not 3NF. The next thing that we check if um, every not prime attribute is fully dependent on the candidate key. So, for example, A, and the candidate key is B, L, H, C, A, T, we know that, but we say that A is not fully dependent on the candidate key. Why? Because there is a dependency that says B determines A. So, that concept says it's not fully dependent. When it's not fully dependent, then it's not 2 enough. So, let's go again. We, when we check the current normal form of a table, we start we start checking with VCN, VCNF. We hope the table is VCNF. If the table is VCNF, we don't need to normalize. The table is good. So then we said, okay, for every function and dependency is the left-hand side super key. Remember, every function and dependency. So BLL is not a uh, super key. Then it's not VCNF. But let's suppose that, that it was. This is not enough to be VCNF because I need to check the other, the other uh, functional dependency. If this, if this is is not super key, but this one it is, then it's not. Remember, every functional dependency, the left hand side needs to be super key. So here is not, it's not VCNF. Then we go down to the next level, 3NF. 3NF. Now we check this side, the right hand side. Is the right hand side prime? No. Let's suppose that it is. If it is, we won't check here. And here we check either this side is super key or that side is uh, prime. If though if all of those tests say yes, 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 then it will be 3 and F. If one of the tests says no, then it's not 3 and F. So we gotta know it's not 3 and F. Then we go to 2 and F. 2 and F we check for non primes being fully dependent. Fully dependent means the only way that can be derived is just by using all attributes from the key together. So this candidate key has a lot of attributes. But we notice that there is a dependency that needs to derive A will only need B. Then we call it not fully dependent because we didn't really need the L, the H, the C, the A, and the T. And that's the concept of fully dependent. Then R is not in 2NF. When, when, it, when it fails the test for 2NF, then R is in 1NF. The PowerPoint should be another uh, a graph that looks like this, that that says okay, our tables that are BCNF, then 3NF, 2NF, and 1NF. We want our tables to be BCNF. If the table is not in BCNF, we we try we, we normalize, and the only way that we don't uh, if, if we leave the tables as a 3NF, if we couldn't get dependency preserving the compositions. Okay, I will stop the, the tutorial here, and I will continue with another example in the second tutorial.